Traveling the Vortex. I am Absalom Dark. Darling Killer. We've joined the Doctor as he travels the Vortex and landed at episode number 276, where the Sonic is mightier than the sword. I'm Keith. I'm Sean. I'm Absalom Dak. <gasps> Dalek Killer. <gasps> Hi, Absalom. <laughs> How are you guys? Excited to review these <laughs> comics. <laughs> and a little miffed that I didn't have a chance to put together an adversary archive for this, or a companion, a chronicle, whichever one you want to... The uh, news is you still have plenty yeah, of time. That's true. That's true. Could, could have gone either way, really. There's a lot of stuff still out there. Uh, I'm glad and I'm good. I'm great. Did you guys have a good week? The week wasn't bad. Picked up Star Wars uh, The Force Awakens on Tuesday. How many times did you watch Super it Super excited. Uh, three. No, four. <laughs> yeah, four. Because I just... Mason and I started the other day and he had to leave. And I was going to wait for him to come back, and I finished it. Thought I'll just go back to where we picked up. Because I mentioned we won't get to finish it until next weekend. So, yeah. Catching up on shows, watching uh, Clone Wars. I'm into season three now. Pretty good chunk of season three out of the way. Went and saw my nephew this morning play his ba- in his band. He's a bassist in a band here in town. Oh, that's cool. It's a group called Morgan and the Freeman. <laughs> and the lead singer's name is Morgan. That's and and she, it's a girl. And then there are three other guys. They're the Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Free mid. That works on so many levels. <laughs> so yeah. many levels. It's it's very, very clever. Uh, I watched them perform. Mason and I have been working on his um, pine, uh, Pinewood Derby car. And we've got it now painted. We just have to construct it next weekend. And I think that's pretty much it. Uh, the other thing that I did this week is just won't go into it much, but I decided to challenge myself and see how long I could go without eating any meat. And how long did you go? I've gone a week, and in fact, Are it was going meatless? to be it was going to be a Monday through Friday, and by Saturday, I felt like I still hadn't been challenged, and so I'm still having any meat for <laughs> since hey. since last Sunday. And I'm not I'm not doing strict vegan. I'm doing pretty much what a vegetarian does, but so I am still doing milk and cheese. I have not had any eggs. That are not already in something like breads or things like that. Oh yeah. Um, however, I haven't I hadn't ruled out eggs altogether. Uh, it, it was it's more for me just to see what it was like and see. My, I thought I would cave by like Wednesday or Thursday. And go, God, you must have meat. Uh, but it really wasn't that hard. And I and somebody at work told me that the the reason it probably isn't hard is a lot of times she heard that if you start craving meat, it's because you're not getting enough protein. I haven't been a lack of protein this week because I've eaten a lot of beans, I've eaten a lot of peanuts, I've eaten a lot of, I've eaten a lot of nuts, I've eaten a lot of peanut butter, I've eaten a lot of thing, mushrooms. I love mushrooms. So a lot of my substitute stuff is been a lot of protein. high protein. Yeah. So it's difficult. It gives me appreciation for vegetarian vegetarians. I, I'm going to give it another week and see where we go. And and one of my motivations for it is I you see very few overweight vegetarians. So <laughs> <laughs> that might also help me eat healthier as well. So. See, I could go vegetarian, but I would eat all pasta. <laughs> It'd be such a carb-heavy diet that I would probably wind up putting on weight. Like you need it. <laughs> <laughs> in in other news, more bacon for us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we Audie had Pinewood Derby that we went to on Saturday. It was pretty. It was okay. He wasn't all about it. <laughs> he started to get bored. He's kind of young. To go. Yeah. He he his car came in fifth in oh. his in his den. Yeah. So. Um, and then we spent today tilling part of our backyard. I'd never tilled before. That's exhausting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dug up so many half bricks in our backyard, and there were so many roots that we had to try to fight through that <laughs> it was quite a, it was quite the ordeal. We watched uh, Everest. It was okay. Who's in that? A lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jason Clark. The guy from Terminator Genesis and Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Uh, Sam Worthington's in it. Um, Jake Gyllenhaal is in it, out of nowhere. (laughs) Uh, Josh Brolin uh, is another main character. And Emma... Oh, I always confuse her with the other one. Not Watson. Emily Blunt? No. Older. Thompson? Thompson. Emma Thompson. Not not Emma Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I know, know. 
Oh well, not not important. <laughs> you would recognize her if you saw her. It was it was it was interesting. Emma somebody. <laughs> Emma somebody. It it was interesting. It was Emma uh, normal. It's it's kind of starts off a little slow, and I think my problem with it was Emma it had, Bronte. <laughs> Ella Fitzgerald. I think it had too many characters. Is the problem with the film? <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> um, so many I can't even remember who they are. It even had uh, Nako Nako Mori. Tosh was in it. That's a lot of characters. How about Yako Smirnoff? Robin Wright was in it. Kevin Kira Knightley. Emily Watson. That's who I was trying to think of. Not Emma. Emma. Emma Close. the Russia. <laughs> Everest climb you. <laughs> yeah, it just it it, it was kind of slow going, and then it, once the drama finally kicks in, it's kind of a little too late because I don't care enough about the characters. And if you don't get that joke, go back and ask your parents. <laughs> <laughs> Did we really just do a Yakov Smirnoff wrestling? <laughs> So yeah, I appreciate hanging out with you guys every week because <laughs> nobody at work understands me. Based on a real story, so you know you can expect how that's going to go. One of them made it out. <laughs> Anyone who died on the mountain is still on the mountain to this day. Not necessarily. Well, according to the end of movie spiel that you get with you know the t- the text and the picture. You know who did die on Everest? Brian Blessed. Brian Blessed did <laughs> die on yeah, Everest. Right. He's back. He made it back. I'm kind of excited about this. We should go. <laughs> I feel like we're reaching this way. We, we, like, we, we, we should plan a let's trip. Let's go this Everest. one out there and see what happens. Nope, that one didn't work. <laughs> I'm not, not going to go there. I, after watching Everest, I don't want to climb Everest. But this is the beauty. If we go this week, we don't have to worry about being eaten because Glenn's given up meat. <laughs> <laughs> we would be the thing that would put him back on meat. I don't know. You're kind of gamey. <laughs> you would be the thing. That I'd be the thing to put him back. On. You know when my meatless diet um, challenged me is when I had no food and I had to eat my friends. <laughs> that was the biggest challenge of staying meatless. That's I the, failed. That's, that's the name of your book. The biggest challenge of staying meatless. <laughs> Everest. Uh, wow, Yakov Shmirov and a cannibalism <laughs> joke. <laughs> Maybe we are reaching this week. <laughs> we we live in interesting times. Mother Russia, is. the Dahmer's party with you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought I just had to put them together. <laughs> that was logical. It made sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when that's logical, we have well, gone off the rails. <laughs> going to put this together with this it's like you can't just let them lie there separately it's, <laughs> you gotta eat one of them <laughs> <laughs> the only other thing i did was finished all the trophies and lego dimensions woot yeah. nice did you do anything fun this week sean no I, wa- I watched we watched half of force awakens on the camping trip which was not the way to watch Force oh, Awakens. Right. oh yeah well that was last week yeah. and then um um, what did we watch this week? We watched some more Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. We we're about, I don't know, almost to the midway point of Season 2. Loving this show. Oh. So good. We're really digging that. And then we we did re-watch uh, Snow White and the Huntsman today just because we had the time and we knew we wanted see, to I go I'd see. I rather go re-watch Force Awakens. Well, <laughs> but we know we want to go see uh, the, prequel. See, I don't. The, 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 the prequel. Huntsman War. Huntsman, whatever. yeah, Winter's War. <laughs> It's a good movie. You should draw. You should watch. It. And, and I'll go one step further. I will go so far as to say that you will enjoy it because it's a different take on that. And you'll go, I really like this. But now that I've said that, you will be bound to determine to hate it <laughs> just to prove your point. So. And Mother Russia movies watch you. That was a stretch. <laughs> it was a stretch. <laughs> but he is in the second one. Yakov Smirnov. He's, he's, he's playing Magic Johnson's character. Oh, great. <laughs> They recast him. <laughs> well, at least they didn't recast him as Snow White. So. Yeah. Well, he could act probably better than that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've seen it or you've not? I've seen The Huntsman. You didn't like it at all? Yeah, not really. Some yeah. of the visuals were all right. <clears throat> well, should we move on to news then? <laughs> yep. Now that I've had a convulsion. Uh, they, BBC Three has announced the cast of Class, which has begun filming now. Starring Yakov Shmirnov and Magic Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> 
The eight-part series will star young new talents, Greg Austin, Fetty El Said, El Said, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, Sophie Hopkins, and Vivian Oprah, and they will be joined by Catherine Kelly as she takes the role of a teacher and powerful new presence at Cole Hill School. So you can go check out their picture, and there's a nice Meet the Cast 360 exclusive thing you can watch that they posted. Kind of neat. Yay. Yay. And Peter Capaldi might show up. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> More universe building. We, I'm all for that. We got a bit of a synopsis now. Time has looked at your faces now, and time never forgets. What if your planet was massacred and you were the, only, the sole survivor? What if a legendary figure out of space and time found you a place to hide? But what if the things that want to kill you have tracked you down? And worst of all, what if you haven't studied for your A-levels? Like all six, six formers, these four Cole Hill students have hidden secrets and desires. They are facing their own worst fears, navigating a life of friends, parents, school, work, sex, sorrow, and possibly the end of existence. Fear is coming. Tragedy is coming. War is coming. Prepare yourselves. Class is coming. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> wow, you're already reviewing it? Yeah. Oh, so that's in the news. Also in the news, Gal- they've announced when galley tickets are going on sale. Gallifrey won 28 years later. <laughs> See what they did there. Mm-hmm. Uh, is, uh, next Does that mean they're going to announce Christopher Eccleston? And you don't like talking about the Omni rumor. Uh, it's <laughs> next year, February 17th <laughs> through <an> 19th. <laughs> that just falls into the same category. of It's speculation. Don't talk about it. <laughs> I thought I had a pretty good clue there so to work with. No, they just, because they've been doing, you know, they've been numbering them. Last year was 27 glorious Last years. Last year's was 27 glorious years, and, you know, 28. What's 28? 28 years later. Yeah, but there's a different That's, meaning there, too, though. There's yeah. another level of, of... Now you've set the bar, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sean and all the, all the poor people at Galley that listen to this are going, Oh, my God, now we've got to book him. <laughs> what have we done? Thanks a lot, Traveling the Vortex. Uh, next year, it's February 17th, 18th, and 19th Ooh. Uh, at the, uh, of course, again, at the uh, uh, Los Angeles Marriott Airport. And tickets go on sale this year, thank goodness, April 16th, which is uh, coming up. Uh, what is this? Uh, Scant days away when you're listening to this. Yeah, 12, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. London. $95 for adults, $50 for teens, $20 for children. There is not a single-day ticket available this year. And uh, the website is, uh, we'll have it in the show notes as well, it's gallifrey1017.eventbrite.com. So they're doing that. You've got a whole login. And last year, tickets sold out in, what was it, three minutes? Something like that. Um, yeah. So if you're interested in going... question is, Sean, are you going to be hovering over your uh, keyboard on that day? I don't know, actually. yet. I've talked to Mel about it, and we have yet to decide. What about you? No, no. Can't do it this year. So I'd be going again? Alone? Yeah, yep. pretty much. <sighs> yup. I don't know. Chris Trackleson. I moved that thing out of February. There's a better <laughs> chance of me going. But. Yeah. Chris Trackleson's going to be. You don't go here. alone. You go with Mel. <clears throat> I know. But You guys make a time of it. so We do. It's a special thing between you guys. It is. And then you bring up great material for our show. I know. So a bonus for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you bring back autographs. It's a bonus for Keith, too. <laughs> but it's not the same as if you guys were there. It just hasn't been the same the since, since I was there. Huh? Yeah, it just hasn't. Oh. That's why I didn't go last year. Oh. This year. You know, just, <laughs> we, we tried it once, and it was like, eh, Glenn's not here. So. That's right. We got our own Gallifrey That's right. in October. Yeah, Time Eddie. Time Eddie. Woohoo! I'm excited. Yeah. All right. Is that it for news? That's it for news. Uh-huh. Move on to feedback. No feedback this week. Oh my gosh, no feedback this week. No feedback. But if you want to send us feedback, you can do so on our website, travelingthevortex.com. There's a nice contact us or slash send us feedback tab there. You, you can <laughs> click on and fill out the form. Send feedback is what it says. <laughs> it used to be one, now it's the other. <laughs> <laughs> I keep getting them confused. And fill it out and send it in, or you can send it through uh, direct g- uh, email with feedback at traveling the vortex. Uh, or you can reach out to us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and the Goodreads Book Club, of course. Maybe instead of send feedback, it should be, you know, yell at us. Yell at us. <laughs> or 
Maybe feedback's a scary word. <laughs> we, should, we should retool that. Does feedback have negative commentation? I commentations? Don't uh, I don't think so. we're in, in synergy. audio. You don't want think feedback. so. That's right. Well, that's true. I don't think we're in complete synergy with our audience. <laughs> All right, well, should we do our reviews? <laughs> yeah. What do you want to do first? You want to do the audio or do you want to do the comment? Well, I think we should go in doctor order. We've been doing doctor order. So we have been doing that, but, but we have more of the audio next week. Not that they combine together in any way, shape, or form. Exactly, so let's just do the <laughs> audio first. <sighs> okay. Oh, well, you wanted to do the comics first. Huh? No, that's all right. We'll do the audio. We'll first. end on the high note of the comic. Why'd you ask? Why didn't you just launch into the comic review? <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't have been the wiser. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> the Auntie Matter. England in the 1920s. Whilst canine is... <laughs> Sorry, I just couldn't help it. Whilst canine is <laughs> off in the TARDIS leading the Black Guardian on a wild juice goose chase, the Doctor and Romana are enjoying a leisurely lifestyle as the Lord and Lady of a London townhouse. But trouble never stays away from them too long. For, or for long. And before they know it, a chance discovery of alien technology leads them deeper into the heart of the English countryside, where a malign presence lurks. As the doctor dodges deadly butlers and ferocious gamekeepers, Romana is faced with a malevolent aunt and an even deadlier peril, marriage. Dun, dun, dun. I really enjoyed this one. And Mother Russia, dun, 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 <laughs> reviews you. No. Uh, I really had to resist an laughing, even deadlier per, peril. Oh, and even Mow deadlier. Wedge. <laughs> Mow wedge. Mow wedge. Mow wedge. Mow wedge. It's what brings us to Cabal. I really enjoyed this story. Uh, even down to who I, I think was, at first, was kind of the weak point for it was Reggie. But then he kind of does this nice growth throughout the entire storyline that where he started off kind of obnoxious and kind of, oh, wow, okay, you're that guy. And then he kind of grows a little bit. Not a lot, but just, <laughs> just enough, enough. <laughs> to make him likable. I, I, I thought to myself when the, when the first open, um, when we had that very long kind of bit of Reggie and, 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 and kind of going on, uh, before we get to the Doctor and Romana, <clears throat> I was like, okay, this is all right. this is what's going on? And then, oh, canine's off in this. What about the dog? <laughs> we left him in there. Oh, he's got the scanner open. He can do this. He can do this. And I thought Keith is going to be so angry. I was so disappointed and by that. And he's just automatic, not going to like this. <laughs> yeah, but I heard the next time trailer, and now I'm really excited <laughs> for next week. <laughs> so uh, this is after Armageddon Factor, right? Yes. Or, or, yes. or is it unclear? No, it is after okay. Armageddon Factor, yes. Well, no, wait, no, that that's not true. No, that that is not true, because they are still running from the Black Guardian, and he says that he has sent the TARDIS in off. In I was order trying to, to remember how yeah, it he he all, sends the TARDIS the off in order to because by the time we get to Armageddon Factor, they have resolved the key to time issue. But at the upset end of it, the Black Guardian, which is why he's chasing them, which is why in the next uh, season. The Doctor has fitted the randomizer to the TARDIS so that he never knows where they're going to go. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so it that's, does, what, it that's does what I thought. Okay. You're right. I I'd forgotten about that. It does, him it does obviously he comes back. Yeah, it, 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 it technically, I think... It can go almost anywhere I think it season. could go anywhere within the season. As soon as they look, figure out who it's the Black Guardian. But the randomizer on, has already been set in the following season, or he has just set it? I think he just set it in So that makes me wonder... That's interesting. That's a good point. I the problem that. is, I, I can't, in, in my head canon, I can't squeeze this in between a key to time adventure because it would seem to me they'd have more pressing things to do. <laughs> well, yeah. We've got to go yeah. get the next segment. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so the fact that they open with that tells me that we've already dealt with that and it's somewhere between the end of that and before Romana regenerates. <laughs> <laughs> before she decides she wants a new body. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I kind of like and, and and I I I reference this only on uh, very limited knowledge, but I like the whole idea that apparently this story is done in the stylings of P.G. Woodworth, 
who yeah. wrote the Worcester and Jeeves stories. He also he was a humorist in the well, primarily in the uh, early nineteenth century or twentieth century, and he it, it's very much done in those style and and pretty much the extent of my knowledge of Worcester of Jeeves is the television series that uh, Stephen Laurie, or uh, Hugh Laurie and, and Stephen Fry did. And it is very much in line with that type of humor and that style and that days. And in fact, uh, the character of uh, uh, Reginald. Reginald actually is very, very similar to Worcester's character in what I've seen in the series. Mm. And uh, I really kind of like the idea that it's almost a bit... Agatha Christie meets Worcester and Jeeves. We get this not very complex story, um, which is just kind of... Uh, I, I, we, we got to the point where we were using the term fun romp so much that I decided <laughs> to back off and quit using it there for a while. But now I think we have a story that qualifies a fun romp. <laughs> yeah. And very much in the, in the humorous style... Uh, or the, the, the humorous style of this really lends to the idea that... The Doctor and Romana have parted ways at the beginning to go off and do their own things, are involved in the situation that's happening, and come back together at the end only to realize that they were both there and both and, were part and of what happened. never cross paths in never the entire time. Paths. I love that whole part of the story. And so that was quite enjoyable. I think the characterization of Reginald was just perfect. He was It was such a great character. Um, while I did kind of see the what was the the girl he ends up ended up with uh, Mabel, he does end up with Mabel. I saw that coming, kind of not not early on, but but relatively late, but before it actually materializes and happens. Um, and so, but I, I liked that. It was such kind a of nice a, moment when it did. When yes, as soon as exactly. those two characters came together, it was like yeah. ah, ah. Yeah, it was it was it was a neat bit of uh, uh, joining of of the two storylines there. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed the performance of uh, the aunt. I thought she did a, a, oh, yeah. a marvelous job, and was very. Uh, I like when the the villain is has one motivation and one motivation only. In, in this style of story, I think that oh, the, having one really motivation well. it works. It, it works really well. I really like the gameskeeper and the butler. Um, <laughs> the android, yeah, yeah. Uh, or the, I suppose he wasn't a butler; he was a valet, I guess. Uh, and uh, I like the the premise of him feeding uh, 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 <laughs> Reginald the lines when he's trying to uh, bait. Uh, he does unwittingly bait uh, Romana yeah. to get to go back to the house. <laughs> uh, Reginald is is one of those uh, unintelligent characters that are that is very lovable. That you you see the folly of his ways from so far away. But you can't help but like the guy, yeah. even though he's, especially when you've realized that he's been put in a situation that he has no control over, and his his uh, dim wittedness is almost used against him. And in, especially after the first woman that they take back, you kind of can almost excuse a lot of that too because of the memory wipes he's been yeah, getting. Absolutely, and I I like that they included that in there so that. He's not just some dumb-witted guy that's working for his who he thinks is his aunt and unwittingly being e- doing evil's bidding. He just it's it having that uh, forgetting factor in there really helps his character. It almost lends to one wondering if the reason why he's such a dimwit now is, is perhaps the memory wipes have been doing something more to his mind and his brain well, and that he been, has control over. And how many times has this happened? Well, you know? yeah, he has that great line of you could lay them down and line Piccadilly Square, and I wouldn't do that, though. Yeah. So you <laughs> wonder <laughs> So you wonder how much effect There's been, the mind yeah. wipe has had on his brain to maybe even make him a less intelligent character every time that it yeah. happens. Yeah, he's been flashy-thinged a few too many times. Yeah. yeah. Um. You, you mentioned um, Green, uh, Greenville, uh, the butler, was uh, performed by Alan Cox, who you may not, because I didn't, I had to look it up. I just thought, hey, the guy was really good. I wonder what else he's done. Yeah, he was young Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Oh, way really? Way back in the day. <laughs> Long ago. Well, this, this entire story had great casting, because the aunt was Mrs. Marple. Yes, yeah. In the and uh, Mabel... Uh, in the pilot episode of Constantine, she was Liv. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, and she's been in a bunch of other stuff. She's going to be in Preacher, and she was in True Blood and uh, the BBC Robin Hood. Oh, she wow. She played Marion. Wow. So this entire story has fantastic cast, and uh, the guy who played Reginald has done stuff too, but I don't recognize him or the roles in the stuff he's done. Another bit of pedigree while we're discussing it. Uh, Jonathan Morris is the writer of this fine work. Uh, we last heard from him in Big Finish and Blood Tide and Flip Flop, uh, which were both his. And then most recently we listened to Max Warp, which I think helps contribute to that fun romp that Glenn doesn't want to yeah. talk about. <laughs> <laughs> it's def- the story just has so much fun in it that it's it's hard not to use that phrase. Yeah, it really does. Because there's also not... Aptly used in this case, I think. Yeah, because there's also not some great, huge world-ending terror and trouble that they have to overcome. It's relatively a small scale. Fairly yes, ro- localized. Yeah. Women are dying, and that is horrible. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not that big a scope that we try to avoid using when it's a fun romp. And at this point, it doesn't even appear that... Um, Auntie has has designs on London. Oh yeah, it just seems it's, like she's just it's, it's, it's just I, survival. I, I, and I like that that motivation for her. Like you said, the the single motivation and the fact that she doesn't have higher aspirations. She just wants to live, and it kind of almost makes her sympathetic. They could have almost pushed that sympathy, sympathy a little more if this weren't a shorter story. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm, I'm kind of glad that they didn't. Yeah, thankfully gl- that, yeah. It, that it's it works. not it works because really of the well. fact that this, this works in the format structure and time length that it is, yeah. Because the only reference you get to it is, you know, aren't, you know, am I not allowed to survive? Well, not at the expense of innocent beings, no. Yes. And that's kind of where they leave that. But. For There for a little bit until we got that bit, I almost thought we were getting a Red Aura situation <laughs> where the bad guy is just nuts and evil and just bad. And those are refreshing, too, so it's... It's, it was almost to that level, but just brought back, just brought back just a little yeah. bit. I also really enjoyed Tom Baker's performance. Um, I, I thought w- when it first started and he's busy tinkering with the device and Romana goes off to have her adventure, I kind of thought, oh, well, he's gonna, Tom's going to be maybe sidelined a little bit for this one. We're going to have to find some reason to, you know, I just kind of, I don't know why in my head he was snuggled into his, his, his den and had his, uh, his, his reading jacket on and was just not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and then immediately goes, oh, we're going off on an adventure. Grab yeah. the maid. Why? I need somebody to ask questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> was, I love that whole thing. It was such a great bit with just, you know, come along, do this and do this and, you know, ask me a lot of questions and, you know, we'll, we'll have an adventure. Okay. Oh, but don't say anything to the missus. <laughs> why not? She'll get jealous. <laughs> yeah. Lots of energy from Tom. Oh, yeah. Lots of energy. And I think it, that the, in contrast to the first season, which even I, I think I liked the first season a little better than you guys did or, or didn't have as many little problems with it, but I also acknowledge that I felt like Baker didn't quite have a full, uh, he wasn't using his full arsenal in, the, in that series, in that season. I think towards the end it got better. I think that, He's finally kind of got comfortable in the the role again. I think uh, to me, he's he's never felt like he's left the role, but it feels like he's he has felt like he's been trying to find the doctor again just a little bit more. He's getting back to, in those yeah. shoes, and yeah. it's almost a it's almost a reverse of how we got the fourth doctor in the television era because it was it was a height of energy from the beginning, which kind of trickled down to the longer that he was doing it, the the more he <laughs> felt like he was phoning it in. Yeah. And and it seems like the first series of this audios sort of did the opposite of that, is where we kind of get a more subdued, slower-paced Tom, uh, slower-paced Fourth Doctor. And by this point, the energy is ramping up, and the character really feels like the Fourth Doctor again at its most potential, and which makes me excited for the rest of the season. And I think it's very obvious that he was glad to be back working with Mary Tam. I think that the two clicked really well, and the characters just fell right back in line. It was mm-hmm. like they, they hadn't left uh, one, one another side from that series, that, that one season that they were in together. Oh, yeah, and she, sound, she did such a good job in the entire story. It sounded like sh- they had recorded this for her back when they filmed it. Yeah, it, She it really sounded did. no different. Spot on. She found the character immediately. Yeah. It was so nice, too, that we got... 
Because I know one of the reasons that Mary Tam left the show, obviously, was that she just felt like there wasn't much to do. That you stand here, you scream, you get into trouble, the doctor comes and explains something. And, you know, she's a time lady. Arguably the first that we're aware of <laughs> to be portrayed on screen in this manner. And, and so she, she's not exactly... I mean, she's fresh out of the Academy when the, the season starts, but yet she's, she, she is not an unlearned individual. She, she's got her, her abilities and things, and yet to kind of still continue to be sidelined into that, why do I have to ask the doctor what's going on? Well, because the audience needs to have that, yeah. that dynamic. And so for her to be given the things to do in this... Uh, where Right out know, of the gate. Right out of the gate, where she's the one, you know, yeah, I mean, she is caught up in this and, and, and in peril right off the bat. But it's not the doctor that comes speeding to her rescue. She gets out of it on her own. Exactly. Yeah. And then exactly. she goes and she helps somebody else get out of trouble. And then she goes and blows up the thing. Yeah. <laughs> in the her end. mind, she solves the entire issue. And technically she does, because oh, yeah. the doctor's robot didn't <laughs> go off. <laughs> It was great having her go off and have her own adventure and be even down to her own companion. Yeah. And then the switching of companions. I, yeah. All of that was just so well done. It's also terrific how the uh, the usage of the idea that, that uh, the, the doctor was the first one to shut down the power that got her out of being... Uh, taken over as the next victim for Aunt auntie and then later her blowing <laughs> the ship flipped. up is the reason why the doctor and mabel don't end up getting you know or was it was he with uh he was, he was with, reginald. with uh, reginald at that point yeah. but the reason why he and reginald don't get uh basically subdued by the uh whatever the alarm system thing that was was uh melting oh, no, her it, was, it was auntie gonna go after auntie was attacking oh, auntie, auntie was, was, was attacking. torturing yeah him. anyway yeah. at that point the, the torture that they're uh submitting to is then turned off by romana indirectly so i love how they had this kind of mirror effect from the beginning to yeah. the end as well it so. were it's such a well crafted story i think from top to bottom that's right the intrusion system was went off when tom with tom when the fourth doctor and mabel first came in yeah yeah, yeah. and, and then he overpowers with it was the her defending yeah. the uh, and it's just great seeing i romana throughout her entire time on the show either lala or mary have for the most part been very competent and and it's nice to see even more of that than we got on television in this. I love the fact that uh, Mary Tam was able to come back and do another series before she sadly passed. And I think the, the most tragic thing about this is the fact that these episodes didn't release until uh, after, nearly yeah. six months after she had passed. Uh, so it's kind of it's, it's sad and tragic that she wasn't able to uh, enjoy in the, the actual release and get that reaction from fans. On the flip side of that, I am so glad that she was well enough at the time that she did it. That we got that we season. able we were able yeah, to get yeah. another season of, of Mary Tam portraying uh, Romana One. Uh, it's it's just another little added bonus to the Doctor Who universe that we we get some more of of Romana One. It really Mary. is. There's a part of me that almost wishes that this story had been a little longer, only so that we could have gotten a couple more henchmen robots. <laughs> the fact that they were all the same. <laughs> I love that they're identical. You know, but there, there, I mean, there were only two. There was the groundskeeper and, and the butler. Yeah. And I kind of felt like there should have been a chauffeur, valet, a valet. <laughs> there should have been a chauffeur and a cook and a you know, just just at all turns. Not for any reason other than I'm greedy and I enjoyed that character <laughs> a lot. And I love their the Doctor and Romana's reactions to them being androids. Oh well, yeah, okay, you're an android. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And Mabel and uh, uh, Reginald's Reggie. almost too hard to comprehend re- yeah. aspect to it because neither one of them really kind of freak out over the idea of the androids. It's almost like it's so incomprehensible that they just kind of okay, we're going to sidestep that. <laughs> we're not <laughs> we even going to yeah, we're not we're even going to try to wrap our brains <laughs> around this. Kind of, what's going on here? Yeah, uh, Reginald's like- dim- dimwittedness almost kind of subdues that idea that or or enforces that idea i suppose that he doesn't really make a big deal about it and i think even mabel's inexperience with it is what makes it uh, acceptable the fact that she doesn't necessarily 
react to it in any such of a, uh, a fashion. And she be. handles everything so so great; it doesn't freak out or anything, and just takes everything in stride. Of well, that's a spaceship, okay. <laughs> It was almost to the point of, um, oh, I don't know, if your brain was trying to comprehend something like a time lock, and it just kind of threw it up as a giant wall. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> That's why Sean wanted to get to the comics. Why don't we review the comics now? Does you guys have anything else to say uh, about the audio series? One, one cool little tidbit. Uh, Sean, for you, when you go see Huntsman, The Winter's War, <laughs> pay attention to the king. He was he played Reginald. Oh, really? Well, there you go. You'll get oh, something. Get to, get you get to see his face, and yeah. I'll go. I know who that guy is. <laughs> Some random king. It just says king. I don't know. <laughs> he may not be the king. He's it's a probably king. not the king. It's a king. <laughs> so one of the kings out there. All right. What do we got? What do we got? No. <laughs> Let's talk about some comic books. Comics. Let's talk about some awesome characters that show up <laughs> in the comic books. Let's talk about how excited I was. Now, I, I, Absalom Dak shows up in these, and I Spoilers. actually had the, uh, the the card shown to me early because I was flipping through a Doctor Who magazine which uh, announced or, or, or showed that Absalom Dak was be going to be introduced to get into the comics, was going to be brought back into the comics. And I immediately got excited at that point. But I was like Keith had you? said in the pre-show that uh, he, you didn't expect it so soon. And I was in the same boat. I did not expect him to be there from episode or from issue one uh, of series two. And I was just ecstatic when he showed up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like the start of the story in general for this. I like being dropped in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah. that's one really <coughs> cool aspect of it. You, you kind of almost feel wait did I miss something here once they show up and it's like oh yeah we're you're kidnapped and we're gonna torture you and kill you and I mean Alice kind of gives us a good setup with the you just had to there was an alarm it was specifically yeah. tuned to us you had to come down and check it out didn't you I said it's a trap you said oh whatever <laughs> and that's so 11th doctor too yeah Throughout all five of these issues, I think their their writing still continues to be spot on for Matt Smith's portrayal of the Doctor. I think so too. Uh, even more so, I think now. Yeah, and I they, think somehow they well got I think, even better. I think what happens is uh, what what they got right is the little asides and mumblings that he always did as his character on television, where he would say something and then he'd kind of under his breath say something else, but then come back. And they've done it right in the in the way that they've done the. They have the dialogue or the, uh, the the text is big, and you can tell when he's done these little aside, to- almost talking to himself moments, because the text is smaller, and it gets big again as he completes a sentence. And yeah. I think that's a really good way to illustrate the way uh, Matt Smith and his doctor would deliver lines, and especially lines where he had inner dialogue within in our outer dialogue within uh, what he was saying about uh, certain things, and I think that worked really, really well. Yeah. Well, and just the almost the long-winded explanations that he would give on the show, they they, they captured those perfectly in this, yeah. too. Yeah. In addition to the asides, the, the long explanations that don't really help explain anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> Think of a banana. No, a banana's rubbish. That sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And this idea that he's being put on trial for something that the war doctor did, and he doesn't remember it because... We think. Well, we they think the yeah. war doctor did. Well, yes. The, yes. the, the alien species yeah. thinks. Yeah. The outcast? Is that who the... That's the creatures take trying to kill... Them. No, the creature is the mud. Uh, as far the as then and now. Well, no, no the, the the outcast is the ones trying to kill the aliens that the doctor unleashed or created, wasn't it? Yeah, wasn't that that wasn't the same? I don't think that was the same as the people putting him on trial. My okay. my app is not loading my pages, <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, I thought it was. I thought it was the outcast too, and I they they called the then and. Uh, what was it? You just said it. The uh, then and now. The then and now. The then and now also had another name. 
that it was what created the then and now, essentially, uh, which were the alien things. And they were called. Well, I thought the, the then the, and now. The then and now was like almost a bounty hunter that they hired. Oh, to that's track right. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. The then and now is the bounty hunter. The the over the arc of the overcast is the ship that they were all living on. The overcast. The overcast. Overcast is the name of the bad guys that are putting them on trial. Okay. okay. What, what right. were the creatures that were killing the overcast? Those were. It starts with an the, I know it starts with an L. The malignant. Malignant. Oh, uh, yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. And then the then and now is the bounty hunter that's yes, one yes. of the bounty and hunters. I was, getting one of, <laughs> I was getting the then and now and the, and the uh, malignant confused. Yes. You're right. The then and now. What another great. <laughs> and what a cool idea. Yeah. And uh, something that can only be visualized on comic. It's a great comic villain. And I love the addition to of the Squire. I've really grown to like her. It's it's uh, an intriguing character that we get uh, we have nothing we have no knowledge of. We've never never been experienced this companion before. She shows back up and we as the story is progressing we're getting bits and pieces of her past. Very very few right now. <laughs> Uh, but they're obviously leading to something, and I like that. It's and very the intriguing that the way that they develop. He doesn't that remember it either. Yeah. That's what I think is even cooler is the fact that we're discovering it as she's discovering it. I think it's and another. She even th- thinks she's young. Yeah, I think it's another <laughs> interesting aspect that we're doing a, we're getting a companion that traveled with the doctor when she was very young, and now she's come back and she's old. Yeah. And as you said, she doesn't realize it until much later that she is. But it's almost a dynamic that we've sort of asked for. I think we kind of got that a little bit with Sarah Jane in with the Tenth Doctor's era. Um, but this is, seems to be an even more uh, somebody. You know, Sarah Jane had uh, issues because of the relationship and what happened with the Doctor. This one's almost like the Squire has no has no change in her devotion. No, has no change in her. Uh, uh, Illusions of the doctor, her visions, or not visions, well, how she. Yeah. Uh, I, can't, I can't even come up with the word I'm looking for. Her uh, at, expectations of the doctor yeah. are the same. There, she hasn't missed a beat since she traveled with him before. Right. And uh, I like that. I like how it's a companion who is aged and has returned to into the doctor's life, and we're getting these, these nice little nuggets and aspects. And I really hope they continue to treat this character the way they've done it and give us these little nuggets and and as she comes to realize who she even is because she doesn't remember very much as well so yeah well and it almost because she doesn't remember it almost feels like she's been plucked out of time yeah time scooped maybe yeah something obviously something to get her out of the time war because you know there's that big wall there i also (laughs) like the way that they're uh we'll get there (laughs) I also like the way that they're uh, addressing the War Doctor. In fact, it goes back to something we talked about a week or two ago when we were discussing uh, uh, John Hurt as the War Doctor. And I was talking about everything is painted based on the uh, War Doctor that we got in Day of the Doctor. And that it's really hard for us to imagine him doing anything else because of his mannerisms and his temperament and his everything about him from that. But I think what's interesting about the comics is it's giving us a glimpse into what the Doctor actually did and went through. And I, I, I was kind of lamenting the fact that, that writers would always paint the, doc, the War Doctor's past based on what we got from Day of the Doctor. But here it almost appears as though we're getting some of that mystery and that, that, that uh, darkness that leads to the 11th doctor well the doctor's past nine wanting to forget the uh, war doctor yeah, what he what did he not just based on the moment but everything that he had done at the time that he took the elixir as the eighth doctor became the war doctor up until the moment that there were a lot of things that he did that were i don't want to say questionable but things that weren't nece- necessarily doctor like what what earned him mm-hmm the reputation to be stripped of the name of the doctor i like that uh that the the writers here at least are going into that uh mentality we had pre day of the doctor of this mystery and all of these bad things that the war doctor supposedly did to make the uh subsequent doctors after that want to forget 
Um, I think ultimately what the story arc will do will it will flesh out the idea that it is a misunderstanding of the Doctor, oh. <laughs> which I think is the conclusion that we came to with the Day of the Doctor, because Sean pointed out the the fact that you know he is very Doctor like in Day of the Doctor. There are a lot of things that make him very Doctor like and should not have ever been essentially metaphorically stripped of the title of the Doctor. Um, but we're getting back to that allure of who is this mysterious guy what could he have done that was possibly so bad aside from the moment what else could he have done why else that, yeah. that would have made him such a uh uh incarnation that that the, the rest of the doctors would want to forget and so i like where they're going with that now I, I like i say i think eventually he will be painted in a better light retroactively but right now we've kind of got back to that aspect it's, and i like it's it. still a matter of <clears throat> With the War Doctor being, you know, what I was excited about is the fact that he was still the Doctor. He was still witty. He was still funny. He wasn't just all gloom and doom. But there's no doubt in my mind that in addition to the moment, which obviously is a pretty big deal, there were other atrocities. There were other things that he did in the name of what is good and just and right and trying to put an end to it. He's always got a gun, yeah, which is a little different than the doctor yeah. that we're used to. Right, I'm sure he's used it. It's not just there for looks and carving no, words no. on walls. Well, I think I'm even, sure he's blown. Well, he ships borrowed that gun even yeah. in uh, even in engines of war. I mean, we had him all out battle fighting yeah. the Daleks. Yeah. I mean, that's that's there. There was no. There was no cloaking that. That was that was something that happened. Right, and and, and later in this one, when we you know the uh, Matt Smith's doctor gives us the bit about I you know freed this chunk of the planet in order to destroy <laughs> that and 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 take out three battle fleets or whatever it was and you know transport it across the universe this is all that's left of an entire planet yeah yeah that's that's kind of some heavy duty right you know carnage and collateral damage yeah so i'm i'm sure there are other things but i i i like that time of the doc, day of the doctor Day of, the the Day of the Doctor's Fifty. I like that it's given me at the very least a cushion. Yeah. That it's not just a rampaging homicidal maniac right. that the rest of right. the doctors aren't going to talk about. He is still the doctor. He's just doing very He's just tough being decisions. a warrior. He's he being is a being warrior. a warrior. He's, 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 which he's, is, is uncharacteristic yeah. for the doctor. But so. the but the, the base characteristics are still there. Yeah. So, so that, that was nice to have that tied in. Um going with the square, uh, just a, a moment that really there were two in the first episode that really kind of just tickled me greatly is when she plants one on Alice for getting them out of the <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the then and now coming at them and just follows that right up with, yeah, I tied a string to the TARDIS. Yeah, so I, I love that part yeah. of it. You know, it's almost like, okay, why do we never else? think of that? You know, <laughs> where's the trail of bread comes to get back? Well, that's uh, actually an old trick because the uh, uh, was it Barbara and uh, Ian in the space museum who unraveled her sweater in order to tie it to the TARDIS so they would know how to get back. Oh, am, yeah. I, am I remembering yeah. that right? I think you're right. Yeah. yeah, I think that is that one. Uh, the Doctor unravels his scarf. Well, we'll Interior. get there. <laughs> we'll, get to, we'll get there to, to, to get to, to get to the zero room. <laughs> but then, so it's not without precedent. Yeah. But then the, the, the greatest uh, image of all time uh, in these comics is the last page of <laughs> issue, issue one. one. And that's that's when I texted you and said, <laughs> ah! Because yes, folks, Absalon Dak is back. <laughs> and how excited were we? Oh, immensely. <laughs> immensely excited. Are they doing justice to his character? Yes. It's very much in line. Um... I think I find the interesting thing, and, and we'll obviously, when we get to, hang on, when we get to, when we go back and we actually do the the Absalom Deck storyline from back when, uh, oh gosh, it was it would have been was it it wasn't even Panini that was doing it at the time, but the in, in Doctor Who comics, uh, Doctor Who magazine, uh, when they were tackling the character of Absalom Deck, it, it, the premise of the beginning of that story and I haven't been through all of the 
material. In fact, the nemesis of the Daleks, I think, is 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 uh, the last thing that I haven't read. I think it's the last chunk of really his story. But everything that I read before is a lot of the setup. The fact that he and and I, I think they did a good job in this of alluding to the fact that he was a mass murderer who was put on trial. And just a little bit of history of this, without giving too much away, he was actually put on trial, convicted of several egregious murders. And his punishment was he was made to go hunt Daleks. That was basically his lot in life, and he ends up falling in love. Well, he with was the woman. actually given the choice. He, could either, he was given the choice: either yes. be evaporated, <laughs> death, or, or battle, or warrior. Go, go fight Daleks and see how long you last. And <laughs> it, right, exactly. And so, assuming he died, his, that's his sentence. When he falls in love with a woman and ends up uh, falling in love and marrying this woman, and. For a good chunk of after she spoilers dies because we know now, but after she dies, she he spends a good chunk of time dragging her body, her corpse around with him in space, and so it's one of those things where they they didn't even they didn't set that aside. They picked they, right yeah, they, up they there continued. and continued that, and it's so much in line with his character. And the guy is is just seriously clinically insane. And so the characterization they've gotten it right in these stories, and I love it. I love the fact. Uh, now, later on in the stories, we also get glimpses into his somewhat humanity as the well, side. which we get a bit of a softer. We get those glimpses of the soft side in the stories uh, in the early days as well. And so I think that, yes, Keith, in answer to your question, long answer to your question, they have nailed <laughs> the character of Absalom Deck. Even the look of him oh, is, yeah. is spot on. And it- his look still fits in with the art style that they're doing it too. Does. Somehow, it it's does. it's it really well done, and I think they did a really good job of. For those who don't know who he is, you get enough information through issue two, and then yes. going forward, you learn more. And they yes. do a really good job of doling out that information, so it's not all of one big info dump. Yeah, it's not a huge mystery. But there's this nice long <laughs> exchange while the doctor's making tea <laughs> and <laughs> his tea. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I I also thought back to a few weeks ago when we did Time Heist, and I thought, oh, for Friday night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, oh, it's so serendipitous that we just did Time Heist and got the glimpse of him in that as well, because he is one of the past well, criminal, yeah. criminals when, uh, I think it's the doctor that hacks into the... No, uh, it's it's Psy. Oh, Psy hacks into the criminal database, and his image is one of the images that comes up. And I thought... yeah. Wow, it's it's just funny that we just did that story for Friday Night Who a few weeks back, and suddenly we've got Absalom Dak back back again. Excuse me, Absalom Dak, Dalek Hunter back, <laughs> and Bowtie Eater. And yeah, I, I love the fact that there's there's almost really nothing for him to do now because the Daleks are pretty like as the doctor said the Daleks are pretty much worth thin now. <laughs> and so he gets so excited when there's a chance that he yeah, might go get to exactly. go kill a Dalek. Uh, and there's the one in the one particular issue. I, we're, I think we're just doing this as a chunk. We're not necessarily doing an issue by issue. Yeah. But there's a one time where he clues on into the doctor using the word uh, bloodbath. <laughs> yeah. And the squire clues into the word. Uh, what does she glom on to? And they're both repeating those words. And I, I just thought it was absolutely hilarious that just those words that they grasped, grasped onto was uh, the so much said about their characters. Yeah. That he is this type and she is this type. And I can't remember what is the word that she keeps saying. I'm trying to find repeating. that page. Uh, it was just before they see the Santaran armies going head to head over the bridge. Yeah, episode four. I yeah, believe. you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Or issue four. Yeah. What did you think of the? Well, Keith's looking at it. What did you think of the the, the third issue where it, the, the, all of a sudden, kind of, we took a narrative break, and almost very similarly got uh, the, the the. If you think back to the fourth Doctor issue that. Uh, Jones uh, was off doing something, and uh, but it was all the I, different color I panels. Love and Eleventh Doctor, Eleventh yeah. Doctor. Did I, I, I yeah, loved yeah, issue three. I thought the structure and how they framed it was so well done. The fact that each panel was a panel of the TARDIS, and, and in the in the window in the panel where the uh, police call box sign would be, the dialogue would be in the same yeah, box as the, as the call box sign. So well realized, and such a cool idea of the. 
the companions are loose wandering the TARDIS and lost, and the doctors. It's, it was such a good way to. It's for a the bottle doctor. episode. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> it's, it's, a, and it's, it's such a great it's way for well the doctor to explore episode. those the, his memories and make it a visual medium where you can have all these doctors are the ones interrogating him the entire time, his yeah. previous selves, and explore to try to unlock those memories in his head while the companions are off kind of lost in the TARDIS. It was so well done. I also liked it. They didn't. I, they they kind of brought it back home and made it seem like it wasn't so much the TARDIS that was doing it, but when the the companions sort of kind of rationalized the idea that the TARDIS is trying to tell them something, and mm-hmm. it's using and it harkened back to Edge of Destruction when the TARDIS is doing very much the same thing in order to call attention to the fact that the uh, fast recall switch is stuck. And so I really liked that they were going along that lines, but then they kind of turn it at the end where the doctor kind of makes it well, no, it really was it was it was me keeping yeah. you locked out. It wasn't necessarily the TARDIS trying to communicate you with you. But there's a still a hint of perhaps the TARDIS was tr- in in protection trying to give them some information as to what was going on there. So they kind of skirted that. Well that's idea. early in the doctor's relationship with the TARDIS as well. So he just didn't know. Well, yeah, precisely. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm quite fine with it. Head can't. <laughs> I also really liked the fact that when the then and now catches up to them and grabs a hold of the doctor and it starts unregenerating him. <laughs> oh yeah, that it's yeah. peeling back the layers. <clears throat> and as the doctor's kind of explaining with his little monologue, that he goes, "Unfortunately, you're about to get hit with the same roadblock I am." And the war doctor shows up, and the then and now is kind of like, "Yeah," and can't go any further and gets thrown back from. Which Whatever is, psychic block is, is there. certainly fortunate that he's chosen to forget that time because that <laughs> ends up being a defense mechanism for him at that point. Yeah, I like that when the uh, that now first shows up, we get the the visualization of the the past and future. We get eleventh Doctor in the center, and then we get the curator on the, one side, yeah, and, the the, and behind and him is the, the first, first Doctor. Yeah. I thought that was a really good way to visualize that impact of, of the then and now showing up. Or, yeah, the then and now. I always want to say now and later. <laughs> that's so silly. <laughs> that's, that's taffy things. Uh, yeah, no, uh, the then and now showing up. And then uh, it seems like that's that the, it's visualized in a new way later on, but I can't remember exactly how it happened later. I really enjoyed the, uh, as Keith was saying, it's kind of a comic book idea, and you could only do it in comic book, but just the fact that it was you know, supposedly... You know, because the doctor kind of says, oh, it might just be something to scare <laughs> Galifian children. But the idea that it's somebody who got a hold of a time machine and then purposely went about destroying every instance of a fixed point in their own timeline to, to create... make them a walking paradox. Uh, yeah. The ultimate paradox. And it's just like, that's hardcore. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a new level of crazy right there. And it's almost a shame that this thing hasn't been... A returning villain. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> because it's like a master, a black guardian, or a yeah, uh, oh, just, to a uh, point. something of now this level. Now, now that they've created it, maybe it will be in the comics. Maybe it will cross over lines too. I, I, I don't. I don't know that I can say that I want it to come back yet because it's going to depend heartily uh, on how we resolve this. Yeah, how, what happens? <laughs> but um, yeah, just just the idea of, the, of it is is way cool. But what I really want to talk about. Okay, so so we got through issue three now. We're up to. Did you did you guys realize it was the doctor's interrogating himself? Not until the end. Not until the end. Not until the panel where we see all of the Patardises with a a portion of each doctor in it. I kind of started keying in a little earlier than that, just looking at some of the silhouettes, and then I kind of suspected the panel, bef- the page before the silhouettes, just based off of more so the one standing next to the light. Yeah, and his pants. I'm like, oh, those are checkered. That's kind of like Trouton's pants. Ultimately, I didn't pay that much attention, but when I went back in hindsight and then saw that it was it was they, they, it was a dropped. lot more obvious. Yeah. Also, the the doctor's monologue with the interrogators becomes less uh, outward and more inward. And so it was at that point that I suspected that perhaps he was talking to himself, but still did not think he was didn't realize that he was utilizing his past selves in order to uh, portray the uh, uh, interrogators. Yeah. So yeah, and it wasn't until that panel that I went, oh, obviously that's who he's talking to. 
and again, exceedingly well realized, and and, yeah. and yeah. it's it's not until you go back and relook at it that you pick up those hints that they've thrown in the artwork and gone, yeah, uh, I should have caught on to that. Um, and yes, I'm ready to admit that apparently, <laughs> although <laughs> it's not canonical, but um, <laughs> apparently, oh, it is close in enough the, in the continuum. It's very in the in continuum. The continuum it's, in the, it's in an episode. Apparently the. Time bubble or the uh, uh, time lock is a physical wall. If that's how you see it, <laughs> it, 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 it that's it, how the humans can perceive it. How they can perceive. Apparently, it. that's also how the doctor perceives it because then he had to poke at it for several millennia <laughs> to break through it. Yeah, <laughs> it's a wall. <laughs> see, I, I we're we're still on different pages. I think as far as the uh, uh, substance harder than diamond, I still think that that. Is the exterior of of the confession dial. of the confession dial, and the uh, well, I guess they're still technically in a time lock, even though now they're no longer destroyed. They're outside of the uh, universe that as we know it. But still, I think that uh, yeah, it, well, it, the, it the, certainly the goes a step further to justify your visualization of the time lock. Sean. Thanks, I'm human. <laughs> No, I just I, I I still I can't put it as the the, the the harder than diamond wall as the outside of the confessional because the castle when they showed the overhead I think it's both I it think looks it's both like the gears and you know just I don't know just, there's there's a round wall already there it just kind of seems like eh, I, I don't I don't mean the physical outside I mean more of the metaphysical outside right. of it. it's, the it's the barrier between it it's probably a combination of the time lock and the uh, somehow, metaphysically, they're connected. So, it's a wall. <laughs> it's a wall. <laughs> Both times. Yeah, the the issue where they're kind of on the space on the planet was there for me. It was probably my least favorite. Uh, it, it, it helped propel the story forward. Where the the junk heap planet. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. With uh, the, the 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 piece until, of Gallifrey that's been removed to. It wasn't Gallifrey, was it? No, it was just another planet. Oh, another planet. oh, okay. Whatever planet he had worn yeah. on at that time. Until the pillar shows up. Yeah. <laughs> and I like the idea of extermi- exterminate. <sighs> and that, and so how they're tying that can, in. Can you tell me in which stories, because I couldn't remember, they're all melding together in my head, that the Master, uh, outside of the Master's TARDIS, resembled a pillar, Sean? I want to say Planet of Fire was one of them. Was it? There's been a couple. There's been a so couple. So you, re- you recall it. So it was an automatically recognition to you. Yeah. Good. Because the one time that I can remember it. <laughs> you were worried. <laughs> it was in that z- zone that we've, the Forbidden well, Zone for Keith. And I went, mm. I mean, it was, some, it was something else it at that time as well. Yeah. But it was also a pillar at one time. And I thought, oh, no. That I don't mean I didn't pick it up through osmosis. Well, that's from the true. I, 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 I don't know if it was in any third Doctor episodes that it showed no, up as no. a pillar. I remember, but it specifically being... Fifth Doctor ones, I do seem to remember. Well, it was a, uh, uh, it was a circus wagon yeah. for the <laughs> third Doctor at one point. I also liked the um, the the, the, van, right? the the throwaway joke that we get at Absalon Dax expense at the beginning of episode, uh, issue four about semantics. <laughs> <laughs> and then later, hand me my Sonic because it's a Sonic device. Semantics, and he just charges out of the middle of nowhere to kill all these alien robots that have shown up. <laughs> kill all, all the all semantics. The yeah. Well, semantics is even still within the dialogue that he's having with Alice, and so it's not. I mean, it, but as he says, semantics, and then <laughs> Absalon, who has charged himself now with attacking semantics. <laughs> <laughs> Here's that as a call to duty, and uh, yeah, that was just and and Alice's comment about this is as a uh, library assistant, this is a complete nightmare. Or whatever, I don't remember exactly how she phrases it, but it's like uh, it's so well written. It is so well written. You might say it's masterful. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. So, and I'm I'm not mistaken that perhaps the batch of Santarans that the <laughs> Santaran propers are in, engaged in battle with are master, master. clone batch yeah, of Santarans. I get, the, I get that impression too. 
that is the, his, his whole uh, his whole I, great I play in there was just a, there. just just enough just that shot of what we presume is him in silhouette discussing the the, the benefits of a of a goatee <laughs> and that you should have a beard and then all the Santarans had beards <laughs> and the rest of the Santarans had to come and kill them <laughs> so the three stories that uh, the, the the idea sorry the idea of the suicide. Bomber Zontara. Oh, too, that's was a chilling element because I yeah. thought something so, uh, a a particular uh, batch of Zontarans bred specifically to be bombs. That was a cool aspect, a yeah. cool element of it. And then when we get the close up of his face, and he has this just like insane look, like the one eye is just not quite right, the other one's looking forward. And I thought, wow, what a what a what a chilling aspect and just one little nugget in this that really kind of expands the scope of the character of the Santarans greatly. Yeah. Well done. Masterfully done. So it looks like so far there at least on television there's been four times where it's a column. The TARDIS is a okay. column. I knew it had been in more than one, but I couldn't remember how many of the, the four other one, were in that The other show. one I've seen is Time Flight. Oh, that's right. Okay, it's playing yeah, I do fire remember one of them. That. Yeah, I do and remember then time. Legopolis and Castro Valva. Yeah. Okay. So there are two in that. Uh, okay. That's why I was concerned when I read that. I thought it's not going to have the same impact. He hasn't seen those. <laughs> I still recognize yeah, it. That's good. So you know, if, if you're having difficulty following along with this story, this is what we're going to lay down. We, we've got Absalom Dak showing up, which is awesome. We've now got Suntarans. And Daleks, of course, and the War Doctor. So that's all awesome. Now we've been given the Master. Let me step back real quick. Okay. Because when he said Bob, I went, <gasps> and then he said Bob the Dalek. And I went, oh, darn, <laughs> darn. But then when he encounters the one, or when they encounter the one single Cyberman on that planet. Oh, yeah. And he talks about how, don't worry about him, it won't come back to life. Well, at least they don't usually do that. I thought, what a great moment. But then I had a revelation. One single Cyberman on this planet left. Is that Handles? Is that, oh, does he pick him because up? Because, he, yeah, he hasn't been picked up yet in this timeline of, of the 11th Doctor. Is this where he goes and he gets Handles? Maybe Possible. Maybe this Cyberman will reanimate soon. <laughs> Okay. Bloodshed, bloodshed is what apparently bloodshed. both of them were. Bloodshed and Vortex Pheromones. Vortex Pheromones is the key one that she keyed on yeah. in on to. And I thought just by each of those characters having those lines spoke volumes about their characters. Because in reality, they're both warriors. They're both very similar characters with great distances, differences. And just those zeroing in on those, what they zeroed in on, were just spoke volumes about the individual characters of two very similar people. And now she does start saying bloodshed later, but that's because she's at that point looking over the hill yeah. and seeing what's happening on the battlefield. And so that's oh, why she then suddenly, yeah, then she <laughs> zeroes in onto it for a, a different reason that uh, uh, Dak does. Yeah. <laughs> I love the fact that Dak also got two of those little cool little alien yeah. insects and set them free on that the snow planet once they get there. Yeah. And tells them not to tell anybody you'll come back. <laughs> yeah. And, and then Alice has the, the fact secret that, now because she overheard it. And that she's beginning to crush on him a little bit. Well, he's crushing on her a little bit, too. Yeah, so it's, it's sure a that's nice little romance. Hands. Yeah. Bill, you got pretty hands, too, by the way. <laughs> It's I nice that we get that moment right right after the doctor once again throws out a uh, Dak chop chop, oh which by the way I do not in fact mean chop chop, <laughs> but <laughs> you know so he's just another dig. You're the yeah. potato one. You're the you know so we we he just, he just continually you know the heck of this. And then right after that we get this moment where <laughs> Dak says some flies. Yeah, <laughs> and it's um, like aw. It 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 actually the budding relationship between Alice and Dak I think if done correctly can be a motivation for 
Dak to get some closure. I don't know that I want a relationship between the two, but closure. but but getting yeah. but getting the 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 beginnings of something could give us some give his story some closure on the wife that he lost. Uh, this might be a chance for him to realize the moving on point in his life as well. And I would love to see them explore that. I'm just speculating and I'm kind of presuming ahead, but I, that would be a nice moment for the writers to say, okay, we've brought this baggage on board with this character that has been consistent from the beginning, but you, how long can you go on with this? Mm-hmm. How long can you go on with this characterization? And this might be their subtle way to put clo- give that closure in order to move on from dragging the <laughs> corpse of his wife. <laughs> across the universe with him on this vengeance. I, I wonder if also part of that will be since the TARDIS squirreled her away somewhere, if until he reaches that point, the TARDIS won't give her back. Could be. That'd be another element to it that would help. Yeah. So when we get to... <clears throat> I know where the doctor's tar- or where the Master's TARDIS is, and we proceed to break in... Just... <laughs> I didn't realize oh, it was Storm Cage. I, I love that they first land and they're facing the wrong direction. Oh, no <laughs> sorry, turn around, Storm turn around. Did, did anybody have any inclination that... We should have known by this panel alone. <clears throat> that looks <clears throat> just like the hallway that yeah. Rory stands in during uh, Good Man Goes to War. Once again, another bit of great artwork. I thought that, we were going to Mondas or something. The, the, the clues are all here. And then, so did you find it, the Master's Tardis? Here? No, 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 no. That's somewhere much, much worse than this. You said you knew where. I do, but it's not here. <laughs> you want me to murder him? I'll do it cheap. <laughs> every, every bit of Dak's dialogue is awesome. I had certainly thought that they were on their way to the Master's Tardis. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. Completely, I bought that hook, yeah. line, and sinker. And when they're questioning that precise thing that he had led them to believe and we show up on on uh uh you just said it storm, storm cage. cage thank you storm cage. which we didn't know it's Stor- we don't no, know we don't until know the final cage. panel yeah and when, it, when it's when river shows up i was like oh and, and that's the beauty of it, marvelous uh squire asked. And i knew she was coming and i didn't i i had seen that like promotional stuff that river's coming to the sh- series I completely I, forgot by the time I was I reading this. I've been looking at uh, promotional footage though, for these comics because we get them so <laughs> we're so far behind most of the time that I, I got spoiled on Absalon Dax. Luckily, I hadn't got spoiled on River, but you had. But fortunately, you had forgotten, forgotten. by the time we got. I think it. at this point, I'm enjoying this storyline so much. I'm just going to start reading it month to month, anyways, and then I revisit. Too. When I we, think I am too. When we do, do a these massive bunch. reread because it won't be a painful struggle to go back and do these again to look at them are again. So good. I just love this, the fact that they, the, the setup is so good. Squire asks, why are we here? Shouldn't we be valiantly fighting our way into whatever the other place is? And the Doctor says, well, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, quantum heist, breaking and entering, galactic larceny, violence, it's not really what I do. But I know someone who does. And then there's the final panel of her behind bars. Hello, sweetie. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> Like, I didn't have enough of that moment all throughout this comic so far. <laughs> there's another one. <laughs> I think the same thing. I like how so far this run, they've each had, for the most part, there's then the two part and then kind of standalone stories, but they're so heavily tied together with the main story arc that nothing, there's been no one offs really. It's been so heavily connected. And I really like that aspect. Well, and I'll be honest, I'm not sure what I expected going into Season 2. I kind of expected something more like Season 1. Uh, yeah, I figured we'd have a couple of I stories here and a couple yeah. of stories here and everything like that. But it's it's totally in keeping with, realistically, what we did get in Season 1. Because, ultimately, there were a little off stories, but they were all part of a bigger arc. And we even commented on it when we got done with it that, yeah, that's very much like what they were doing during Matt Smith's tenure. They were kind of doing these big, long, overall arc yeah. things. And so when we get to this, and I get to, which, by the way, issue five is, is actually titled The Judas Goatee. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't catch that Didn't until catch now. That um, but when you get to, the, to, to issue five, and there's River, and I went, oh, cliffhanger, we're only doing five issues this week. So I immediately jumped forward and kind of looked just to see what was up. And it's going to be kind of, it looks like this might be the, for the entire run of this season. It's doing it. Which would be wonderful. And I like the idea that they're going to do that, but they've also kind of 
they've still done this in chunks because yeah. we had the part one and part two that was the, the trial planet and we were introduced to all the characters and then we, we step away from that and they each issue has its own elements then. but it is one, one continuing They're all part story. of the great story. story. I, I think it's elevating beyond what they did on television. Yeah, I agree. More this season, season one was because nothing's felt like a one-off. Like yeah, we get in the series. Yeah, there was there hasn't been a curse of black spot. Right. Well, other from than the bottle six. show, maybe, but just but no, no, that's even, not even from, that not from dealing, plot, but from but structure. But that's dealing with yeah, structure wise. Structure-wise, I think yes. that's what I think makes these issues feel elemental. Individually and elemental, but it still continues that thread, that narrative thread, more so than the series did. It's the really strong serial storytelling. Yes, agreed. So then I was very angry that we ended on a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be like that the entire year. I think so. Yeah, because they've all been kind of cliffhangers, uh, to some degree, or more so for others. But even the the Tarda, the Master Tardis, it's a masterful. That was a great cliffhanger, yeah. too. So, I mean, it's all been boom, ba boom, ba boom. Makes you want to pick up the next issue. It, yeah, it does. It, it really it, does. I think it also, this type of storytelling, because it's intertwined so much, there's so much story that you're not focusing. If, if you are reading these month to month, I think this sort of storytelling is a little maybe easier in comic form. Um, remembering what happened so many months ago when it's not you've had seven stories since then while you have it feels like it's one long story so you remember it better than what was that one element of the angel two-parter that I need to remember going into this it's not that kind of storytelling which I think for comics works even better. Yeah, especially since it's a month to month instead of yeah. week to week. Yeah, and so it makes it easier to remember from month. I remember month. going back uh, when I was picking up the Buffy season eight uh, issues, and there were a lot of standalones that I. And then when we got to the kind of the end of the season, I needed to go back and revisit some of the first issues to remember. Okay, what's the big arc going on here? So mm-hmm. it can be a challenge. All right, Sean, what are we got coming up on the schedule? Well, coming up next on the schedule... We have schedule revisions. The revisions to the schedule. Slight revisions. Slight revisions. Mostly minor. Bold minor. Major minor ones. Um, This week for Friday Night Who, uh, we are concluding the Armageddon Factor with parts four through six uh, in order to get more Fourth Doctor and Romana uh, Big Finish audio goodness, uh, which we will review next week. We're going to do the next two episodes in the Fourth Doctor uh, arc. Uh, season two, which is number two, The Sands of Life, and number three, The War Against the Land, which I have it on pretty good authority, maybe a two parter. <laughs> quite possibly I scheduled it that way on purpose. <laughs> the following week for Friday Night Who, we're going to do The End of the World, uh, which of course we've already reviewed because it's a ninth Doctor story, but that means we get to go beyond the Doctor with Christopher Eccleston, and we will be watching Elizabeth and discussing his fine performance in that. I'm assuming it's fine. It's been, I've seen it and I don't remember him in it. Huh. So maybe, maybe it's, did it's you just, see it before you knew who he was? I know, no, no, yeah. that's the that's the different. This is the one of those ones that is the oh okay, but um, I just don't rem- I don't remember much of the story either. So oh. it's been a really long. Like I saw it when it came out, um, but then uh, we're going to finish out April with uh, Friday Night Who uh, will be Ambassadors of Death parts one through four, not one through three, because Keith pointed out that it's a seven parter, not six. I don't know why I thought it was different. <laughs> Uh, and then we'll uh, do the next three parts, the final three parts, and we decided to keep that the same because that's kind of how we've always done that one. Uh, But in between those two um, parts for our episode, actually, we're going to be reviewing the Lethbridge-Stewart shorts. That was the other thing I forgot. I've got to go back and add that to it. We're going to do In His Kiss by Sue Hampton, The Enfolded Time by Andy Frank Mallon, and there was another one, wasn't there? The egg one. The egg I can't remember the name yeah, of it. That, that's, I forgot to add that to the schedule. I will go back and do that now, so it'll be on there. We'll have the three Lethbridge short, short stories, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about unit dating. The black eggs of Khufu. That's Thank it. you. And then we'll finish off Ambassadors of Death at the beginning of May, and then we'll have our uh, review of the um, April selection for the Traveling the Vortex Book Club, which we didn't have a title for. <laughs> we do now. It's The Stone Rose by Jacqueline Rayner. So uh, you may want to start reading that since we're in April. 
All right. Be sure that you support us on this podcast. If you're uh, already a Patreon supporter, thank you very much. If not, we have this little uh, click-through link that you can go to from our website, and uh, you can become a supporter as well. Any little bit helps, and 100% of those proceeds go right back into this show. Uh, we also have some sponsors on the uh, side right rail of our page. We'd like you to click through and check those guys out because uh, portions of those proceeds go back into this show as well. And we have added some new sponsors uh, this week. I do want to point out that Think Inc. is now a uh, sponsor for us as well. So uh, an advertiser, I should say. And uh, the I wish they were a sponsor. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool. And uh, TV... TV shop.com is uh, another one. So uh, be sure to do that. Uh, we've also got some Google AdSense on there, which will help add some revenue to this show. So please support us by going through there and, and clicking on those links, clicking on those ads. Uh, I think that's it. I don't believe I have anything else. You guys have anything you want to uh, add before we wrap up the show? I don't think so. Well, sorry about the audio glitches this week. Apparently we've got a mic problem, but we powered through them. So. All right, that's going to do it for this week. Until next week, I'm Glenn. I'm Sean. I'm Keith. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Be seeing you. In Madarasha, Vortex travels you! You have been listening to Traveling the Vortex. Doctor Who and all of its associated programs are owned and trademarked by the BBC. No infringement is intended or implied.